Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 17th annual Norman Williams Distinguished Lecture in Land Use Planning and Law, hosted by Vermont Law School's Environmental Law Center. I'm Jenny Rushlow, Director of the Environmental Law Center and Associate Dean for Environmental Programs at Vermont Law School. A little bit about the Williams Lecture. Norman Williams came to Vermont Law School in 1975 after a long and distinguished career in public service and teaching, particularly in the area of land use planning. Professor Williams played a key role in founding Vermont Law School's Environmental Law Center. And the Norman Williams Distinguished Lecture in Land Use Planning and Law series is a gift of Francis Yates, trustee of Vermont Law School in memory of both Norman Williams and Anya, class of 94, and Charles Yates, class of 93. Today, we are very pleased to welcome our Williams speaker for 2021, Molly Mowry. Molly Mowry serves as the executive director of the Community Wildfire Planning Center, a nonprofit whose mission is to support community wildfire risk reduction. She's also the founder of Wildfire Planning International, a land use and wildfire mitigation planning consulting firm that provides services to communities across North America. Throughout her career, Ms. Mowry has successfully launched and managed national wildfire programs, including the Fire Adapted Communities in partnership with the US Forest Service and the Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire program. She's also designed and delivered national trainings to educate land use planners and fire professionals, including the first wildland urban interface planning curriculum for the US Fire Administration. She's a certified planner and a member of the American Planning Association, and she serves on the Sustainable De Development Code Advisory Council uh, through our own professor, Jonathan Rosenblum and is lead author of the American Planning Association Planning Advisory Service Report on Planning the Wildland Urban Interface. She holds a Master in City Planning degree from MIT, and her talk today is titled Planning for Wildfire Resilient Communities in an Era of Uncertainty. For our audience, thank you so much for joining us today, and we will have time for questions and answers after the presentation. So please type your questions in the chat box at any time during the lecture, and we'll get to as many as we can in the remaining time. Please join me in welcoming Molly Mowry. Thank you so much, Dean Rushlow, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you can start to see the beginning of the presentation. Let me just navigate to that, and we should be Good to go. All right. So one of the things that I actually wanted to start out sharing was just how I became a wildfire planner, since I get this question frequently. Um, I Back in the early 2000s, I had just moved back to the US from living in Germany, and I was really interested in the idea of sustainability. And at that time, sustainability was I think the buzzword of the day, uh, soon to be somewhat a precursor to the term resilience. So I got really excited about what this field of land use planning could do to save the environment. I started working at a land use planning and law firm here in Denver, Colorado, which is where I'm based. Um, and then I went back to grad school. I went to MIT while I was there. I was taking a city design and nature course from a professor named Ann Spurn, who had a student, or she was a student, I should say, of Ian McCard, who was a famous landscape architect and a name you should definitely know if you study the AICP. Um, and that's when I started focusing on the interaction between natural hazards and development and climate change, specifically related to wildfire, more specifically related to this topic of the wildland urban interface or the WUI. So I chose the WUI as my thesis topic, much to the humor of my peers at the time. Um, I don't think any of us fully appreciated back then that it would become such a relevant career path. So fast forward 15 years and my professional life has two primary hats. 
I am the executive director of a nonprofit, as Dean Rushlow mentioned, the Community Wildfire Planning Center. And I also have a consulting firm. I've had that for a number of years, you know, working with communities across the US and Canada. So my daily life is immersed in all things wildfire planning. So I wanted to start out by providing some context for the WUI and the situation that we find ourselves in today. The term wildland urban interface or WUI first cropped up in the early 1970s when a physicist at the Stanford Research Institute used the term to describe a situation related to urban development and wildfires. So in its simplest terms, he said, the fire interface is any point where the fuel feeding a wildfire changes from natural or wildland fuel to man-made or urban fuel. And for this to happen, wildland fire must be close enough for its flying brands or flames or, or um, what we call flying brands or embers, embers or flames to contact the flammable parts of the structure. So this concept actually was not new, even in the 70s, communities have actually been burning for mm, several hundred years in the US, but the relationship between development and location and topography and wildfire hazard was really gaining traction, especially following the Bel Air Brentwood fire in 1961 in California. This was kind of referred to as a high profile celebrity fire in LA um, because it was in a neighborhood where many celebrities lived and many of them were their homes burned or they were evacuated. Uh, this is a more famous picture, which you may have seen uh, from Life magazine of President Nixon at the time using his garden hose to wet the wood shingled roof of his rental house on North Bundy Drive during the fire. But today we still think about the wooey in similar terms. So conceptually, oh, I just may have disrupted the slide, I'm sorry about that. Um, conceptually, we think about the WUI as based on a set of conditions. So that may include the location of the structures, the type and quantity of vegetation next to the structures, uh, topographical features, you know, our, our homes built on ridge lines. Incidentally, all of these photos I'm showing you were taken in what would be considered the WUI, and they're from all across the country. They also were all evacuated from a fire. So it doesn't mean that a WUI has to equal evacuating from a fire, but we'll talk about that in a moment because obviously we care about the WUI because it is where wildfires can cause more damage. So think about the WUI as a set of conditions, but also from a practical standpoint, we map the WUI because it allows us to analyze and plan these geographic areas. So this map is based on a national data set that has uh, spatially defined the WUI based on structure density and location, or excuse me, and vegetation. It was produced by the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the US Forest Service. And here the WUI equates to almost 10% of the entire land area of the uh, conterminous US. The estimated population living in the WUI is roughly about a third of the US population. You'll notice that it looks like most of the WUI is in the southeast and east. But if you were to zoom in at a much finer scale, you would see a lot of pockets in the West um, that are more orange or yellow to indicate the WUI. Um, it, I should also note this is not a fire hazard map, so it doesn't predict where fire will occur or reflect the actual fire hazard, but it does give us an idea of where the population is, structures, and where um, vegetation is. I think, I don't think I mentioned this, but there's about 44 million housing units in the WUI, just for reference as well. This is also a little bit detailed, um, but we can start looking at these maps in terms of growth trends. So one of the things that um, these researchers did was look between 1990 and 2010, the number of houses located in the WUI 
So it grew almost 14 million during that time period. In other words, we are adding a lot more homes to the wildland urban interface. And as you'll see in a moment, that sets up a difficult problem in terms of fire. Also a little bit detailed, but maybe worth mentioning here is that there is a difference between the interface and the intermix. I sometimes joke that WUI interface is a bit redundant because you're calling it the wildland urban interface interface. Uh, and then there's the intermix, but you can hopefully see the distinct development patterns from where these homes are either tightly grouped against uh, vegetation or where they're interspersed or scattered throughout wildland vegetation. So you can have both types of WUI and these distinctions become more useful when we start to think about the relationship between development patterns, structure density, and ultimately structure loss during a fire. We last year saw a wide variety of WUI areas affected by wildfires. A few examples include the Bab Malden fire in Washington state, which burned 15,000 acres and destroyed approximately 80% of the town of Malden, which was a small town um, during a fast moving incident over Labor Day. You know, one of the things that stood out to me from this particular event was that the fire burned 121 homes and 94 other structures, but those other structures included the city's, uh, the town city hall, their local fire station and their post office. So significant services that really were at the the core of the community. Also in September last year, we saw large portions of the towns of Phoenix and Talent, Oregon get almost completely destroyed as well. Here's a picture from the Almeda fire, which started in Jackson County, which is in Southwest Oregon. Strong winds pushed the fire north along a bike path that was parallel to the interstate and they, uh, the fire was burning power poles. Um, blackberry vines, which are considered an invasive or nuisance species there, and eventually homes. It burned more than 3,200 acres and destroyed 3,000 structures, uh, including one of the fire districts, uh, three, uh, one of their three firehouses. In the upper right image, you can see the fire perimeter that was really a linear pattern along the highway. So these kinds of examples also have been challenging you know, where we think of the WUI. It's not just somewhere out in the remote wilderness, but really it's some of these uh, areas that didn't think of themselves as really that fire prone in some cases. So meanwhile, in Colorado, where I live, we experienced the state's three largest fires recorded uh, this past summer in terms of acres burned. One of those fires was called the Grizzly Creek Fire. It burned along the major transportation route of Interstate 70. So if you've ever been skiing here in the mountains, you've probably driven on Interstate 70 and you realize it's the major highway that connects, you know, uh, the Western states, uh, in, in especially through Colorado. So with the shutdown of the highway, it really disrupted local supply chains for several weeks. But Maybe what was even more unusual this year, at least in Colorado, well, in, in other parts of the West, was some of the extreme fire activity that extended late into the fall. This is actually a picture outside of my office window. I was working kind of later into an evening in October, and I looked up and I saw this large smoke plume rising up from a fire in the mountains, which you know, the day before had been somewhat insignificant, but unbeknownst to me until I looked at the news that the fire had grown by 100,000 acres within a 24 hour period. It required, as you can imagine, the evacuation of multiple towns. And these fires were across the West were fueled by a combination of extreme drought conditions, dry, dead fuels, wind, and higher than average temperatures all of which we are experiencing again this year already. Um, California, of course, was no stranger to this either. They also experienced their largest fire in state history last fall called the uh, August Complex. It burned more than 1 million acres and almost a thousand structures. 
I do want to point out, I'm, I'm talking a lot about the size of fires, but the size of a fire doesn't always equate to how damaging it is. For example, also in California, the Tunnel Fire, which was known in the, as the Oakland Hills Fire also, um, or originally, in 1991, that fire only burned 1,600 acres, but it destroyed almost 3,000 structures. So just keep in mind that fire size and damage are not always directly proportional when we're talking about specific events. I also do want to point out that this is not just a Western issue. I know a lot of my slides are focused on what's happening here in the West, but certainly we see wildfires and wooies across the country, across the world, um, as you saw on the earlier national map of, of the US too, the, that the wooey is very prevalent. Um, about five years ago, around Thanksgiving, the Chimney Tops 2 fire started in the Smoky Mountains and destroyed major portions of the town of Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Uh, I think there were about 2,500 structures, including homes and cabins and businesses. So definitely not just a Western issue. And also I'm highlighting very significant fire events. Significant in today's terms are of now structure loss being in the thousands. but it really wasn't that long ago, even when I started working on wildfires, that a major event might have been a hundred structures. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that those events still occur. We just don't hear about them as often. And uh, they still are very significant. So I'm giving you the, the extreme version, but please keep in mind that you know, this is a, a, an occurrence that um, is prevalent across the country. The causes of these fires vary. Uh, every year in the US, we have anywhere from 50 to 70,000 wildfires, but the majority of these are human caused. This varies a little bit by, well, it, it does vary by region. So for example, in some places in the Southeast, there are more human caused wildfires as opposed to in the Pacific Northwest. Um, some communities I've worked in, you know, the fire chief has told me that almost 99 to 100% of their fires are human caused. And human caused can be anything, it's not just arson, but power lines, down power lines, equipment sparks, or escaped burn piles, uh, basically anything but lightning. These Fires also take years for communities to recover from. About 10 years ago, I toured an area called Slave Lake, Alberta, a year after they had experienced a major wildfire, which destroyed about a third of their town in uh, 2011. And so recovery was still very much underway at the time. But one of the things that really stood out to me was in talking to some of the recovery specialists about the social challenges that they were experiencing. So the town had this collective post-traumatic stress disorder. They were seeing an increase in alcoholism and domestic violence. Um, doctors and teachers and other professionals had moved south to Edmonton rather than want to take the time to rebuild because they didn't feel that they had the time. So there was this really the significant invisible impact that doesn't always get accounted for when we talk about damages. You know, since that time, Slave Lake has very much recovered, but I, you know, I think in the interim there can be a very painful process in terms of what happens through that long-term recovery phase. This is certainly very much underway in Paradise, California, which experienced the campfire in 2018. So another extreme look at an impact of one of many impacts that they've been experiencing is with their water supply. Uh, the fire didn't burn, it burned many parts of the water systems, but in places where it did not burn the water system, it contaminated it with benzene. And so even 10 months after the fire, there were residents that were still there but they couldn't use the water to brush their teeth or make ice or cook or drink. The image on the right shows a public health official examining a water meter in the town to test the inside home, to test inside of the homes that were still left standing. So 
it's in this case believed that the benzene is coming from melted plastic pipes, but I believe that's still under um, under study. So I did not just come here today, though, to show you destructive pictures. I, I will have some more, but I will try and you know really refocus this on. We know the problem. What can land use planning do, though, to address wildfires? And I had my own aha moment um, in terms of thinking about planning's role in wildfire mitigation while I was listening to a state forester talk about fire, this a particular fire called the Highway 31 fire in South Carolina. This was early on in my planning career. And as I was listening to him, you know, he's talking about how the fire started from a resident burning household garbage. It escaped in these high winds. Um, it made a six mile run towards a residential area where it caused a lot of damage. There were 76 homes destroyed and several thousand people evacuated. I believe it's still considered the state's most destructive fire. Um, but what was actually more interesting to me was where he pointed out development features that either helped the response or resulted in more home loss. So in this case, he pointed out how the utility line had acted as a fuel break to stop the spread of the fire because of the vegetation had been cleared below it. And we certainly know in other cases that um, these power lines can be a reason why fires start, but in this particular case, it was a good thing that had changed fire behavior. He also talked about the water features that enabled firefighters to quickly access water during their response. And then he also talked about the proximity of homes to one another, or excuse me, homes to the forest, as well as homes to one another and how this led to a dynamic of home to home ignition. And then there were some very interesting pictures that were more about the reasons for some of the damage. In this case, there were embers that had landed in the vegetation and began burning bushes right up against the vinyl siding, which began to melt. And they had this you know, great image of catching this fire in the moment and being able to put it out. But it really started helping me understand how these little benign features that we, we don't even think about when we are approving development or looking at landscape plans and how they can play a big role in terms of long-term fire damage or long-term structure loss. So since that time, I've really had the opportunity to learn more about fire behavior and wildfire mitigation and how these concepts can be integrated into the planning process. This is another example from the Waldo Canyon fire in Colorado Springs, where I was able to join a group of experts and we interviewed the fire department and, and looked at factors that contributed to home loss or home saves in this particular fire. And one of the reasons here was the relationship between the unmanaged vegetation in these ravines and the lack of setbacks from the slopes. So these areas can make a, a really big difference in terms of why homes survive. So when it comes to wooey planning, there's some larger concepts we can start to think about. The first one is site design and layout. So when subdivisions are being proposed, communities can determine where is it appropriate to allow the subdivision. This is typically tied to a hazard map that identifies the highest wildfire hazard areas, either at the local or through a state mapping process. Um, planning requirements can either direct development away from high hazard areas or at a minimum determine what the appropriate requirements are to mitigate the wildfire threat. Another opportunity for reducing wildfire risk to subdivisions and other residential areas is through including requirements for appropriate access and water supply. This ensures that first responders can safely respond to, an, to a fire and um, have resources available to them. Evacuation routes also allow the public to safely exit from an area. So you're looking at ingress and egress. And it's amazing, but so often in communities I work in, we don't always see this, even in new development. So old development has you know, some historical context as to why they may have not built a certain way, but it's surprising in new development how we still don't necessarily see requirements for adequate water supply and uh, 
emergency or I should say secondary access routes. Mitigation may also mean that vegetation management or landscape has to adhere to certain requirements. You may have heard the term defensible space, so it's the concept that areas around homes have reduced or modified vegetation so it doesn't sustain fires and, and burn the structures. This could also include types of plant species that are not allowed to be planted within a certain distance of the home or screening measures. You know, a lot of people like to use you know, highly combustible cypress uh, bushes as, as something that would be a screening mechanism. But, I, but those can lead to a lot of home to home ignitions as well, because you have the relationship between what's the plant or what's the, um, you know, what is the feature between two homes that is combustible. And then, of course, mitigation can take the form of requiring ignition resistant building materials and construction methods in wildfire hazard areas. So this doesn't also have to be just for homes, could it, it could also be for attachments like decks or fences, which are also highly combustible. And then finally, we can ask ourselves as land use planners, whether some land uses themselves are appropriate in certain places. So we do talk a lot about residential development, but we can also ask whether there should be conditions on land uses that may have a higher susceptibility to wildfire and result in more threat to neighbors, like a sawmill or areas that store gasoline or petrochemicals. So it's not that you can't have one of these, it's just that the question is more, where is it appropriate to have that use and what type of mitigation would make it safer? The same could be true about vulnerable land uses like hospitals, care facilities, or prisons that may require special evacuation considerations. So there are many, many different ways that we can start to think about planning tools. And I want to dig into a few more of them that are specific to, you know, the tools that I work with on a regular basis with communities. Some of these are driven by federal legislation, others are based on state requirements, and many are implemented at the local level. Uh, I wanted to just recognize at first that there are a lot of different plans and regulations. I'm only going to highlight some of, I think, the more common ones, but it certainly doesn't limit the conversation to these. So just jumping right into it, there's three plans that I want you to be aware of that are really opportunities for engaging either tying land use to wildfire hazards or integrating hazards into land use planning. So the first one is the comprehensive plan. This one you're likely familiar with already in terms of what the general role of a comprehensive plan is. It's also sometimes called the general plan or, or master plan, depending on the community you're working with. These are long-term planning mechanisms for this 20 to 30 year horizon. You know, Traditionally, they focused more on physical development, but many contemporary plans factor in economic, environmental, and social topics. So this is really an opportunity for resiliency, climate change, sustainability, natural hazards to play a larger role in the long-term community planning process. Um, I'm, I see communities addressing the WUI in a variety of ways, going back to that Highway 31 fire, which was actually in Horry County, South Carolina. When they updated their comp plan a few years ago, they integrated more wildfire and forestry context and, and information into their natural resources chapter. And they had a goal of becoming a fire adapted community through wildfire education and mitigation and development regulations. They also had several policies, which included uh, amending their land development regulations to address defensible space, um, discouraging approval of design modifications that reduced the required number of um, improved points of ingress and egress. So they really looked at how they could set the stage, or I should say build the foundation long-term with these policies uh, to make changes over time. 
States uh, also at the state level can specify the type of policies that are required to address wildfire. So California as a state has a very robust approach to hazard planning. Um, per state law, it's mandatory for all cities and counties to have a general plan. And then these plans are required to address hazards to ensure the protection of the community from any unreasonable risks associated with the effects of all types of hazards, which includes wildfire. Cities and counties that have lands in certain designated zones, which are specified by the state, uh, here's a map to illustrate generally where these are, um, they're required to have in their safety element of the general plan a number of policies that speak to specific requirements for wildfire hazard planning. And I think what's important to point out here too is that the state set up a dedicated land use planning program within CAL FIRE, which is their statewide uh, fire agency, to support communities in updating these plans. So they also have created a capacity and resource mechanism with tied, tied to this legislative requirement. The California approach is definitely a best practice. It's not what we see everywhere. Um, recently, we just did some research on this and Colorado, for example, has state statutes that require counties and municipalities to adopt a master plan, but it's only at the municipality level that the master plans must address hazards counties, it's, it's actually optional for them to address the same hazards and land use topics. So I found that interesting. Similarly, when we looked at Washington, um, many jurisdictions there are required to adopt comprehensive plans based on their state's growth management, but the hazard element itself is still optional. Uh, so that means communities don't actually have to include wildfire as part of their comprehensive plan. Um, we looked at several other states. This is just a, a picture of the report that we put out recently. So if you are interested in it, there's a lot more detail there and I'll give you a link at the end of the presentation. So two other plans just to be briefly aware of is the Hazard Mitigation Plan and the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. FEMA requires that state, tribal, and local governments adopt hazard mitigation plans as a condition for receiving certain types of non-emergency disaster assistance. Um, this includes funding for mitigation projects. And CWPP similarly, are they're hazard focused, but they're specifically focused on wildfire. CWPPs have been in practice since the early 2000s when the Healthy Forests Restoration Act was passed uh, or was, it was signed into law in 2003. They're not legally binding documents, but they can be an effective way for communities to work with land management agencies. So specifically, you know, if a community's neighbor is the U.S. Forest Service, this is a good mechanism for communities to plan with multi, um, you know, multiple land owners in terms of private and public ownership. So in these cases, it's really these are hazard oriented plans and the opportunity is to bake land use into them and make those connections. So ideally communities would have all three plans, but it's certainly not a given that they do. And ideally the plans connect to each other. Um, the major criticism I hear is, well, that's all great, but plans just sit on a shelf. And I would argue that, well, first of all, it is the process that is really important. The development of the plans can be very collaborative and build relationships that are needed for the long-term implementation. And the plan is a good starting point. But I do agree that without implementation, the plans are not as effective as they need to be. So implementation in terms of the WUI world is very much through regulations. There are other options, you know, incentives, other programs, but I wanted to highlight some of the common regulations for the WUI, which include the building code, fire code, subdivision regulations, zoning code or land development code, and then there's a WUI code, which can be a hybrid of some parts of all of these, as well as a kind of a standalone code. 
Um, so building codes, fire codes, and WUI codes are most often based on model codes or standards, and then they're amended. So for example, the state of Washington several years ago adopted portions of what's called the International Code Council's International WUI Code, and that became part of their state building code, which re just recently took effect this year. Um, the new statewide code includes requirements for ignition resistant construction, uh, for uh, also requirements for decks and minimum standard for driveways. The state also has adopted the International Fire Code, which is effective in all counties and cities in the state. And this has complementary uh, requirements for the WUI. Uh, just so you're also aware, this isn't only a Western thing. The state of Florida's Fire Prevention Code also has a chapter on the WUI that local jurisdictions can adopt, although I'm not aware of any that actually have adopted it to date. Um, and you also, you may be wondering, why am I even bringing up the fire code or building code? These are typically outside the purview of a planning department. But one of the things I really found in my practice is it's important to know about these codes, A, because we have to know where there could be conflicts, or B, where there can be overlap. So for example, with fire codes, often what's regulated in terms of the WUI is road widths, road grades, water supply requirements, sometimes even limits on vegetation in some areas. And once you start starting, and once you start looking at a subdivision code, you realize that there can be very similar things regulated through a subdivision code, such as access uh, and water supply and lo lot design, layout, vegetation, etc. Uh, Missoula County, Montana is a good example. They have in their subdivision regulations a section on wildfire hazard standards. Um, it regulates the design and the development of these subdivisions and has requirements in terms of you, know, you can't have a subdivision placed on some topographical feature where extreme fire behavior will be a present. Um, there's also some requirements for vegetation clearing and maintenance. So it's not to say there's a conflict, but it's just important to say that communities really have to think about which codes are most appropriate for them to use to regulate the WUI. And then finally, zoning and land development codes may also impose development conditions uh, tied to specific uses or zoning districts. Uh, some jurisdictions like Summit County require rezoning applications are subject to wildfire hazard standards. Some of their standards include very detailed provisions like, you know, restrictions on firewood storage or, you know, the depth of mulch has to not exceed a certain amount or fencing materials cannot have a combustible attachment right now, uh, attached to the house. So what I see most often in terms of WUI regulations is that communities regulate the WUI through a combination of several of these approaches. Uh, for example, LA County has a building code, a fire code, a subdivision code, which primarily addresses the WUI in terms of residential units and street system types. And they also have a zoning code, which has a chapter for a specific local area called the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and then they have a general plan and a hazard mitigation plan. And it's certainly not a bad thing for communities to have multiple touch points for regulating the WUI. You know, I think the, I don't even wanna say it's a challenge, but more the consideration is deciding what is appropriate for a community in terms of where their starting point is you know, what sort of hazard mitigation they are required to do according to the state level, if anything, and how that fits in with, you know, where they want to go. So how can it be administered? How can it be enforced? And of course, you know, what's the political reality for adopting regulations? This is where a lot of my work is focused, is you know, bringing together firefighters and planners and elected officials to help them navigate this, this world of um, WUI policy and uh, planning and regulation. So where are we headed with all of this? And you know, the question is, can, land, can more land use policy and regulation 
save us from wildfire hazards, I would suggest that we will always need a combination of strategies. Um, we did not get into many other related topics today, such as the history of fire suppression and landscape management practices and how those have shaped wildfire risk over time, uh, but they will also continue to be necessary for fire suppression and response. Um, or I should say fire suppression and response will also continue to be necessary for managing the WUI as well as good land management. And then yes, definitely better land use practices. All three are necessary as we move forward and consider the wildfire risk reduction and long-term resilience. And thinking about this as I was putting together this presentation, you know, I, I, I am, I don't know if the expression is an eternal optimist, but I really like to be optimistic about the work that I do, the role that land use planning has in the WUI. Uh, but I also suppose there's a part of me that's a realist. And so, you know, I do think that the situation in the WUI may get worse before it gets better. Reversing some of the development trends that have shaped the WUI will take time. Many of the regulations I discussed work well for future planning, but there's still a lot of resistance to the implementation of statewide building codes. You know, in Colorado, we have been talking about statewide building codes for almost 10 years, if not longer, and there's still the, you know, there's still a lot of resistance to it. The perception is it can be expensive or that people shouldn't have to be regulated that much. Here we, we are a home rule state, so there's also the, the notion that local communities will simply you know, take care of the problem and address it on their own, but that isn't necessarily what's happening. Then there's also the issue of, well, what about everything that is existing? Um, it can also be costly to consider retrofitting homes. You know, maybe if we're just talking about replacing a wooden fence, that isn't necessarily that expensive. I mean, it certainly could be expensive, but when you start talking about larger features like roofs and windows or decks, um, that can be really expensive, as well as communities themselves and the infrastructure. How do you retrofit you know, roads or driveways or water systems that were not built to us today what we would consider a minimum standard? So in these cases, I think it will require a very heavy focus on evacuation planning, uh, in what improvements we can make to structure materials and dealing with overgrown or unmanaged vegetation. But there is an element of reality of how much we simply can retrofit some of these larger infrastructure uh, systems. And then of course, there are other factors that will exacerbate our situation. So as we started out in this lecture, wildfire activity in the US is already changing rapidly, particularly in the West as conditions become hotter and drier. We're seeing earlier snow melt, higher temperatures, drier soils, drier vegetation. You know, just this week, I read several articles. Um, one of them was uh, discussing in California that they're experiencing this month in April, low, the lowest level of fuel moisture ever recorded, which means plants and trees are extremely dry. Um, they're dry, as dry now as they typically would get in July or August and we're just starting out the season of you know, where they should be, where they should have the most moisture. Um, these, all of these factors are extending fire seasons. No one really refers to a fire season anymore because it's just so untenable to think about you know, the predictability of, of our climate systems. Additional uncertainties that we see related to the WUI and the future of the WUI are longer term trends with real estate markets and property insurance and even population migration. So residents across the West are beginning to see insurance providers refuse to renew some of their policies or they're finding coverage very hard to get or, or very expensive. 
Um, there are related uncertainties on how insurability and the real or perceived wildfire risk concerns will affect the real estate market. So re research to date has shown some conflicting effects of wildfires on housing prices in terms of some home values being temporarily depressed in fire prone areas, but I don't think we have the long, long enough or long term trends to see if this is going to be something that is um, is more permanent. A lot of other unknowns, you know, there's wildfire evacuation fatigue in some communities now. And how long do people want to continue you know, having this anxiety when the fire season, uh, well, when it's in full force um, or when there's smoke in the air? We also have been seeing or trying to learn about some interesting trends with COVID and the pandemic and telecommuting patterns that might be changing. You know, on the one hand, we've heard places or people are fleeing the cities, and is that making a big difference? Um, all of the evidence to date is very anecdotal, so it's hard to see a longer term trend in terms of are people really leaving the cities and going out to some of these more urban, uh, or excuse me, suburban and semi-rural areas, it, what would be considered the wooey. We don't know, but it's certainly something I think to track. Another um, something to track is there's some interesting legal cases coming out of California. So there's some growing concerns over climate change and its impact on wildfire that are beginning to challenge housing developments. The California Attorney General, General recently filed motions to intervene in lawsuits that were challenging the County of San Diego's approval and certification of environmental impact reports for a proposed large project called the Ote Ranch projects. So the arguments that in the filings that the state made were that the EIR, the environmental impact reports fail to adequately analyze the extent to which projects could increase wildfire uh, risk. Um, they didn't fully assess the cumulative impacts from wildfire on the development, and the, they didn't really address the project's impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. So that's all to say, I think as a result, in places that are more highly regulated, like California, I think we can anticipate that addressing climate change and taking measures to really mitigate wildfire in robust ways are going to be essential for the approval of new large scale developments in these high hazard areas. Oh, I skipped forward just one slide. Um, so few key takeaways that is that the WUI is very dynamic. I want to challenge you to think about these conditions that exist across the entire country and you know where we may, even if we don't see a quote fire problem now, where we're set up for a fire problem. So a few years ago, I was interviewing a fire historian named Steve Pine and really learning a lot from his many years of wisdom and working in this field. And one of the questions I asked him, you know, was where he saw the future heading. And, you know, he, he shared that he was really concerned about just a few temperature degree changes in places like the Southeast. So when you saw that national wooey map, you know, perhaps there's not a regular annual fire problem now across the entire southeast. They certainly do have fires, but not at the scale that we're seeing right now in the west. But you know, what would happen with just a, a minor tweak to the climate where temperatures are increasing, precipitation patterns are changing? So it, I know I presented today, this is very much a, a western challenge, but I think we're also seeing that wildfires will not only set records here, they will likely to continue to do so in various ways and, and climate change will play a big role in that. Uh, the good news, if there is good news, is that there are many plans and regulations we can use to address wildfire. Um, it's important to know the dynamics between what the state requires, what locals require, and really, you know, I, I heard recently someone say, we no longer need to frame it as an opportunity, but really an, an imperative. You know, why aren't states requiring local communities to address wildfire hazard and other hazards in their planning process. Is that really the few, is that really going to get us where we need to be in the future? And so I think planning as a, as a whole needs to be integrated into a much more holistic approach that includes 
hazard mitigation, climate adaptation, and resilience. Uh, if you really would like to learn more, I hope you do. There are a few resources that I pointed out or were mentioned today. These two, as well as several others, are on our website, the Community Wildfire Planning Center's website, communitywildfire.org. So you can just go to resources and download these. Um, the planning, the wildland urban interface, the APA report, you do have to go to the APA website. You don't have to be a member. It might make you sign up for a little um, registration, but it is a free resource. And it's, I think, real, a really good deep dive into planning tools that you can start to think about in a, in a more detailed way. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share my perspectives and insights on this. I really hope this was helpful and interesting and got some of your wheels spinning on how in the future you can really think about that integration of wildfire and hazard planning as part of your land use journey. So I am happy to take questions and I'll stop there with the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Molly, for that really interesting presentation. We have a few minutes for folks to ask some questions in the audience. So for those of you out there listening, please add your questions to the comment box and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. We've got a couple to start with. First, are you aware of successful efforts to implement retrospective WUI regulations on existing developments to mitigate wildfire risks? Yes, we see this most often at the structure level. So they're called home hardening programs. There are actually a few here in Colorado that our Community Wildfire Planning Center has been working on. Um, one is initiated in Eagle County, Colorado. It's called the Real Fire Program. Uh, Boulder County also has one. But essentially what these do is they look at existing properties and a professional assessor will go out and talk to a homeowner and talk to them about their risks to their structure and how they can make improvements so that those their homes can be more resilient to wildfire. And we have seen some successes already through that program, those programs. They're, they're new, but those types of programs are certainly gaining traction across the country. Great, thank you. Another um, one of our audience members asks, could you please speak a little about the risks wildfires present to biodiversity loss of flora and fauna and habitat loss? And how do you plan around that? It's a great question. Um, I think it a lot of that may depend on what the local laws are. So for example, when we were doing work with LA County, they have sensitive areas that are protected. And in many cases, there's a large balance between you know, what is required on one set and what's required on the other set for fire mitigation and for uh, preservation of sensitive habitats. Most of the time, they work very well together, but sometimes there are some potential ways where some has to be preserved in a different way. So it's really a process of navigating with what those regulations are and getting the right experts to talk about, well, what does the what does the biologist think, but what does the fire mitigation expert think? And so it's, I don't want to say sound like it's a compromise, but it is something in the field that has to be uh, communicated very clearly. I saw also today the Forest Service is it's it's coming out, but the Forest Service is publishing a great resource soon on the WUI. And it's not just about the wildland and run interface as a fire problem, but there will be a number of different considerations for water, um, habitat fragmentation, um, you know, species, whether it's invasive species or species preservation. So that may be something to look for. I'm not as well versed in all of those topics, but it will be a really great resource once it's available. And it should be this um, anytime in the next few months. Okay, thank you. Um, from the media coverage of wildfires in the West, you hear stories about, you know, this celebrity's home was burned down and had to build a mansion somewhere else. And 
um, at least from that coverage, it seems like it's been pretty well off communities that have experienced these issues, at least perhaps for those of us in the Northeast that are learning about it mostly through the media. Are there equity considerations here? Are, are there low income communities or communities of color that are affected differently by wildfires? Yes, that's an excellent question. And the answer is yes, there are definitely a number of different considerations. Um, I think traditionally there was a, a general thought that, well, it is, you know, it's these rich people's homes that are burning and um, very much that has been shifting over the last, I'll say, I'll, I'm generalizing, but over the last five or so plus years, a couple of thoughts is that you know, one is that it is commu communities that are directly in the fire's path are very much connect are very much uh, affected by this. So whether or not your home burns or you're displaced, um, but I think we have to start thinking more broadly about who is affected and how during a wildfire. So last year we saw so many smoke impacts across the entire West. You know, some of the um, air monitoring systems were the smoke was so intense that the 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 air monitoring systems couldn't quantify how bad or how hazardous the air was because there wasn't anything that high so the point is that you know folks with asthma folks with sensitivities uh, that was very difficult now that california is also implementing what are called public safety power shutoffs that's also a huge impact for uh, populations that are more dependent on electricity for, let's say, medical um, medical requirements. So there are a number of age, gender, race, um, ethnicity, you know, considerations. Another one would be how communities can really not just provide materials that may be translated in a different language, but what's the connection point for helping different populations understand what their risk is. Um, we need to do more than just provide a, a brochure that says, you know, these are the five things to do uh, during evacuation. So there's, I think we're learning a lot. Um, we're playing catch up in some cases um, to understanding how this is affecting so many different populations and what we need to do to really meaningfully increase resilience. Another thing that we see in the media is um, there was that coverage of the terrible wildfires in Australia. And um, is there anything you can share about how other countries handle wildfire mitigation? Are there any good examples of what the US should be learning from other countries? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, well, one thing I do know is that in Australia, the level of training is quite impressive for how planners will learn about bushfire risk assessments and integrate that thinking into the development planning process. So I wish I knew more about successes coming out of Australia um, because I do know they've done a lot of great work to better integrate land use planning and wildfire hazard than perhaps we have in some cases here. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know enough to give you a, a well, a good response for that. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any way that wildfire planning can take into account um, populations that maybe can't afford housing upgrades um, or, or otherwise uh, will we'll find challenges with um, complying with local regulations? Yeah, that's a big question right now, particularly in California. In fact, the state just passed some legislation and um, an increased budget to start helping populations that are disadvantaged or low income to upgrade their homes. Uh, I think I can't speak to the FEMA's BRIC program, which is building resilience for infrastructure and communities um, in terms of what, I don't know enough to know if that specifically targets low income, but I do know that California has taken a pretty big step forward recently to try and address this issue. 
One of the things I should add is that some of these measures are very expensive. Some of them are not as um, expensive in terms of cost, but may require some labor. But for example, the first five feet of your home, one of the best practices is to remove a lot of vegetation or even let's say uh, something that could easily burn, like you store some scrap lumber against your house. Keeping that area clear is a very effective way to reduce home loss and it's not necessarily expensive. So one of the key components to that is educating people on what that looks like, not just, you know, it, not just assuming that it will cost a lot of money, but what other strategies do we need to reach people to help them understand that there are some changes they can make on their own, even if they don't have the funds to necessarily do replacements on their on their actual structure. Earlier, you pointed out that a power line corridor helped firefighters stop a fire. What role does energy infrastructure development play in mitigating wildfires? It plays a, a large role. Uh, it depends. Oh, there's many factors, I should say. You know, one of the things that I learned recently is how expensive undergrounding power lines can be. I think it was anywhere from two to $5 million per mile. Um, so I appreciating that undergrounding isn't necessarily the way that many of these um, risk reduction measures can be addressed, but vegetation management is one maintenance of the lines is another, you know, I think that microgrids is another that I've learned about recently. Um, so there may be some areas that are serviced by very long line transmission lines, but they don't necessarily, if they're on a microgrid, then there can be some strategic ways of not having uh, these utility corridors and high hazard areas. Um, you know, another thing that's emerging out of California, which we probably may continue to see, but it's a very interesting dynamic, is the relationship between these public safety power shutoffs, purchasing homeowners purchasing generators, personal generators, so that they have power in their backyards, um, and then what the implications are for having something that is essentially contributing to climate change more with these personal uh, generators, as we're trying to mitigate what essentially is these climate effects. So we have high wildfire risk days, certainly understand why people want a personal generator because you could be off power for hours or days. Um, but yet on the other hand, the quick solution is contributing to the problem long-term still. So I think, you know, we're starting to be challenged in ways that we think about big picture energy usage, but also personal energy usage and how to find short-term solutions that aren't just contributing to the long-term problem. Many of our students at Vermont Law School um, are passionate about these issues and want to be able to make a difference. Can you speak a bit about the way that you've seen lawyers play a role in solving this problem? Sure. So I uh, grew up in my planning career working side by side with land use attorneys and I really appreciated as we talked about in the in the in the seminar, you know the role that regulations have in moving these um, actions forward. So I think land use law is a is very much a part of this. Um, you know I'm also working with a developer in California that has retained a law firm uh, as part of the development and. You know, helping as that lawyer works with the developer, they're also working with us on understanding what those best practices are and how that um, development can integrate those best practices into the into the um, into the community. Um, I think the one of the things that I have learned, whether you're a planner or a lawyer or both, um, is working very closely with the fire departments, fire marshal, fire chief, fire districts, um, there's a whole host of fire officials 
really working closely with them, whatever your profession is, is this can't be done without them. I certainly don't want to, you know, give the message that planning alone can solve these problems. It's such an integrated approach. And so the extent to which you can make friends with who those people are in whether in the communities you work in or the topics that you work in, I think will be very valuable. One of the challenges with getting um, good policy made, and we see this on the environmental side all the time, is that there are opponents of these policies, you know, for instance, um, oil companies or um, developers in some cases. Are there any natural opponents or opponents that you see recurring that, that don't want to see these kinds of fire prevention or mitigation um, regulations in place? Yeah, this is a bit surprising and I don't want to overgeneralize, but one of the, one of the surprising difficult organizations or, um, sectors that has come up is, um, environmental groups that may be opposed to certain forms of vegetation management on landscapes. And not to say they're 100% opposed, but this does come up um, more so in work with colleagues that work at this landscape scale. So there are some challenges around, you know, how you how you might have to balance mitigating or managing a landscape for reducing fire risk. But then on the other hand, some people don't want any of that vegetation removed. So that can be a challenging process to navigate. Um, CEQA and NEPA often come up. And um, I, I think, I don't, I don't think this is the only solution, but coming to the table in education is really key in this case. Um, and so that is one of the areas that is a surprising place where you think there'd be some maybe natural alliance. We all have the goals of, let's say, climate adaptation, but how you get there can be two different ways. One of the devastating impacts that we see again in the media, in addition to the loss of human life and loss to property, um, has the animal rights community played a role in trying to solve these problems? Because you see such devastation to wildlife, to animals that are affected, their habitat is lost, um, they are injured or, or die. It's a great question. I can't speak broadly to it. I only know anecdotally some of the communities we've worked with that have taken you know, specific measures to know that, for example, what will happen or planning ahead for livestock um, when fires are a threat. So a lot of it that I'm familiar with is more on the advanced planning side of how to create evacuation systems that will allow for large animal evacuation as part of the process. Uh, but from a higher level, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to you know, if there's a, a, a broader movement or some other organized approach to it. How do you see WUIs evolving as, um, as climate change worsens and uh, the impacts become more extreme? Well, one of the ways I would like to see WUIs evolve is how to better think about all of the reasons why we need better land use planning. So by that, I mean, you know, rather than have scattered developments that require a lot of, um, a lot of infrastructure, how we can be more strategic with infill and redevelopment and focusing our services and some more priority areas. Um, I, and that's not just about wildfire, but I think that's better you know, you could call it smart growth principles, uh, but better planning in general that's less reliant on a very carbon intensive approach towards our habits. So I, I'm 
I don't want to suppose that we'll only see highly clustered development and compact development everywhere, but certainly I think we need to think more about what are those sustainable requirements for us when we're talking about uh, future WUIs and how if there are communities that are further away from urban cores, what does that look like? Are they on microgrids? Are they less dependent on, um, on uh, you know, traveling every day with a personal vehicle? And are they also, um, are they positioned well for evacuations? You know, I think there's a whole host of measures that some of these isolated WUI communities will have to consider if they want to be prepared for wildfire. Um, but I think there's a, I think there's a lot of smart planning we could be doing that if we do it right, it will encompass the wildfire as well. Um, as we as we wrap up here, I'll just mention um, in 2020, in, in the year of the apocalypse, we we had a wildfire, <clears throat> excuse me, in Vermont that was traveling underground, which just mm -hmm. seemed like you know icing on the cake of a truly hellish year. Is that a thing? That I've never heard of it before. Is that is that a significant part of wildfire proliferation? It is a thing. Um, we're seeing it more in places that are melting the like permafrost areas. Um, I used to live in Scotland, so there's some of that thick peat um, that there can be peat fires and uh, they can keep burning. I, Russia has this challenge as well. I think in um, Northern Canada, it is a thing. Um, I, you know, I, I think we're going to see too is the climate changes and there's a, more of a conversion of species and changes in temperature. I, I won't be surprised if we see more of that in the future. We like to think of ourselves as, as somewhat immune to the effects of climate change, at least in terms of, you know, some of the worst effects up here in the north. But so that's that's upsetting to mm -hmm. hear that we'll have our own unique challenges, including underground <laughs> fires. Well, we are well, just about out of time. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just said I'd like to end on a slightly more positive note. I um, realize I probably presented a lot of long-term doomsday, but I, I I think the positive note is the fact that I'm here, um, that there this the wooey conversation has been much more elevated in recent years by, you know, students, journalists. Um, I even saw a talk late night talk show hosts use the term wooey several years ago. So I guess the good news is that this is all bringing it to the forefront and it's really helping us understand you know, what we can do with this um, as opposed to bury our heads in the sand, so to speak. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for educating us. I think this is a topic, especially on the East Coast, that we we are a little more ignorant about than those communities that are most affected by wildfires right now. Um, but as you point out, it's it's really everywhere. So thank you so much for a really interesting and educational presentation. And thank you so much to our viewers for joining us today. Um, the, the talk will also be available as a recording. Um, so uh, feel free to share with your friends if, um, if they weren't able to watch it. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a nice night. Thank you.